Hey everyone, happy Valentine's Day and welcome to Calvary Chapel Online. My name is Kelly and I'm so glad that I get to welcome you to church this weekend. We are excited because we are in our second week of our series in the book of Mark. And we're gonna be in this book for 26 weeks, but I can promise you that it's going to be an incredible time together in the word. And Pastor Doug is gonna continue in Mark chapter one this weekend. So you can go ahead and open your Bible or your Bible app to Mark chapter one right now. As you're doing that, I wanna do a special shout out to anyone watching for the very first time. We are so glad you are joining us and we would love to connect with you. All you have to do is text the word new to 31352 so that we can stay in touch. And a reminder for everyone out there who's watching with kids in their home, we have content made especially for them, all age groups. Don't miss it, it's online and available for them at any time. And now before we go into a time of worship and opening the word together, we're gonna to turn it over to our live host in the sanctuary. Good morning, Calvary family, how you doing? I see a lot of red in the audience. Happy Valentine's Day. Hope you guys celebrate well. We are so glad that you're here. It's my honor, my name is Ruben, to welcome all those online, as well as those who are in the room. We're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. In just a minute, our worship team's gonna take us away in worship. Following that, our lead pastor is gonna continue our study through the book of Mark. We're looking forward to a great Bible study. After that, I'll be back up to dismiss us in an orderly fashion. Please help us maintain a safe environment by keeping your mask up at all times, as well as maintaining a safe social distance. If you're not yet standing, please stand with me and let's worship our King Jesus. God bless you.
shout of love to you, Jesus, for you're worthy. We give you our hearts today, Jesus. We're gathered here for you. We're gathered here to tell you that we love you. So we remember the gospel. We remember the story when you changed everything, Jesus. We pour love on you this morning. You are worthy, Jesus. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath The planets fall If the stars were made to worship So alive Thank you, Lord I can see your heart In everything you've made Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation. 
creation sings your praises, so will I. So will I. It's what I was made to do. Love me. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. Spoken all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Oh, 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 oh. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what. sing this. Let your heart engage with his. Tell him you love him. Don't just listen. Don't just watch. Pour out worship before him this morning. Maybe just say the words, I love you, Jesus. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in river, so will I. Since roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the Fall shy. Then we'll see again a hundred billion times. God of salvation. You chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. But as you speak, Billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I could see your heart in everything you've done, every part. Designed it a work of art called love. If you gladly chose her in this, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every press is one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. And you would again 
a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just say thank you to Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Say, I love you, Jesus. Would you repeat this after me? I was the one. Say again, I was the one that you left the 99 for. Thank you, Jesus. I was the one. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. I was the one. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus, that your love for us is so much greater than our ability to love you back. And your word says that we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, God. You started the whole thing. And so today we just stand as recipients of this love that we could never understand fully, this love that we could never conjure up, this love that can never be invented. If all the poets of the earth, all the writers on the earth, if all the great songwriters of old, they still could not put together a work of art that's so beautiful as your love, the story of the gospel. So thank you, Jesus. We just stand. We allow ourselves to just be, be affected and touched by that truth today, that we were lost and dead in our trespasses and sins, and you resurrected us and made us alive with you. Thank you, Jesus. So today, for the hopeless, I pray hope. For if there was no hope, it seemed when you were buried in the rock in the tomb, and yet you burst forth. If there was no hope then, and yet you proved there is always hope, then today we speak over them. Move, Jesus. Move in ways that only you could move. And today we fix our eyes on you and our expectation on you that you teach us about the word, teach about your, your scriptures, teach us about your life, teach us about your character, that we would walk out of here changed and more in love with you than when we came. So we give you the time and we dedicate it in the name of Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. 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 One more time. Tell him he's worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for worshiping with us. You guys can have a seat. Hello, family. I'm Drew. And I'm Annie. So hey, if you're married, February can be a great reminder to invest in the precious relationship God has entrusted you with. When you go to calvaryftl.org slash couples, you'll find helpful resources like couples classes, date night challenges, biblical counseling, and more. It's all on our couples webpage or just text the word marriage to 91868 to stay connected to all that's available to you. And hey, don't forget about the Married Couples Retreat, August 27th through the 29th at the JW Marriott Marco Island Beach Resort. It's called Resist the Drift, with guest speakers Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley of Focus on the Family. Just go to calvaryftl.org slash couples retreat to explore more and to register. And here's a way for all of us to grow and go together. Join a group. Absolutely. Being in a group enhances life in every way. And as our church explores the Gospel of Mark on the weekends, groups are a great place to dive deeper into the teaching series during the week. We've made discussing Mark in your groups super easy. Just tune in Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. for our Mark discussion video online or head to our website anytime that works for your group and click on the blue button labeled this week's group resource. Now, hey, men, listen up. It's time to come together and learn to be resilient in 2021 at this year's Resilient Men's event. Gentlemen, this is your moment. Friday, February 26th at 7 p.m. at the Fort Lauderdale campus. So don't wait. You got to go to calvaryftl.org slash men to learn more and register. That's all for now, but you can always explore more at calvaryftl.org. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Calvary Chapel family. How are you doing today? 
Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, just a reminder, uh, flowers and cards for the one you love, even the original Valentine, your mom, if she didn't get a Valentine card from you, this would be a great time for that. Anyway, we are so glad you're here to our campuses and to our online community. We are in a series in the Gospel of Mark, so if you have a Bible, open to Mark chapter one. Hopefully you're reading ahead, because over the next few months, we'll be reading through this story of Jesus. And so uh, Mark chapter one is where we're gonna be today. Grab your Bible, find your place. And as always, as you, you come together in a, in a room like this and you, and you look around, you're like, wow, this is really big. How, how do I answer my questions about what we talk about today? And, and the simple answer is on Wednesdays, we, we actually have a, a video debrief where we can add, get together in a group and talk through some of the main points and ideas of this because we wanna not just connect you with God, but with other people. And so there's so many opportunities to join a group, either live or in Zoom or online. So we'd love for you to be a part of that next step, getting to know people. And one of the ways we do that are the classes that we offer. In a couple of weeks, on Wednesday nights, we're gonna be offering a series of classes on taking your faith and making it practical. So maybe you're a new Christian and you're like, man, I'm trying to figure out how to do my finances or how to do marriage or how to raise kids or how to deal with anxiety or even questions about the end of time. What does the book of Revelation say? And listen, we have a class for all of those and more in Spanish and English. Uh, go online and find out what classes are available so that you can not just learn, but then discuss in groups what you're learning together. And that's what we call the family of God coming together because that's our mission to make disciples and to teach what Jesus taught us as followers of him. And so that's an opportunity we want you to take advantage of, whether it's a group or a class, uh, jump in. You will be blessed, you will learn, and you will grow in the grace of God. And so now we wanna pray and ask God to enlighten our hearts and minds as we read his word together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that's open before us in this story that Mark wrote down, his Jesus story. And Father, we know that this story has affected so many people's lives, and so we pray that as we read his story, we would see in these letters, in these words, in every sentence, your love for us. There is no greater love than the love you have for us, and there's no greater hope than the hope you offer all of us in the gospel. That's why the gospel means good news. So as we read this good news today, make it true and real for us. Change us. Change our hearts and our minds to be more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you weren't with us last week, we started in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark starts off, starts off right away, hey, this is the story of the beginning of the good news, the beginning of the Gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God and he's come to earth. And, and it's like he puts it right out front. And, and Mark, as he tells his Jesus story, unlike the other Gospels, is an action-oriented uh, teller of stories. He's like a movie producer. His favorite word is immediately, 41 times. He uses the word immediately to go from scene to scene to scene to scene. Not a lot of long monologues or even long dialogues, but just action after action. And so if you're a new Christian and you're like, I don't understand the Bible, listen, Mark is the easiest book of the New Testament to understand. It's just there and easy to read. So that's why we hope you read ahead and read along as we go through this series. But one of the things that Mark does right away out of the gate is he, he tells us, the, the main idea of the story, it's like, it's like a mystery novel where we know the, the main idea of the story that Jesus is the son of God and that he's come on a rescue mission, but that all through the gospel narrative, the people in the story don't know. It's kind of like reading a, a mystery novel and you, and you look at the end to figure out who did it and then you read the whole story and sort of fill in the blanks. Anyone ever want to find out the end of the story before you read the beginning of the story? Yeah, it's like, I, you know what, I, I wanna know how it turns out, and then I wanna go back and read the whole story. And so we have an advantage over every other person in the story because we know who Jesus is. But it's interesting, if we can look through the eyes of the original readers, they're trying to figure out who is this man. And, and one of the things that first attracts people to Jesus, we're gonna see it three or four times in just the first two chapters, is this word, authority. Now usually, when you hear the word authority, you think, oh no, I'm in trouble. Or maybe today, because authority has taken a hit, people think, oh, authority, that's bad. People use their power or misuse their power. But there's something about the way that Mark says that people are attracted to the authority of Jesus. And he, he first begins 
to say they weren't attracted first to the authority of Jesus, but the authority of John, this guy that was baptizing in the wilderness, that though he wasn't on the inside crowd or part of the elite group of religious leaders, that people by the thousands and tens of thousands would travel all the way into the Judean wilderness to listen to this guy preach and be baptized by him. And he would say things very directly with no presumption and no hypocrisy. He would say things like this, you need to repent because the kingdom of God has come. And who has warned you for the coming wrath of God? I mean, this was one of those preachers and people were cut to the heart and they repented and they were baptized. But then John, at the height of his popularity, at the height of his spiritual authority, he makes a statement in the very first chapter of Mark that's sort of shocking. He says this in, in Mark chapter one, verse seven, after me comes one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What is John the baptizer saying about Jesus? He's saying, if you think I have power and authority, it's nothing compared to the one who's coming after me. If you think I have the spiritual influence to see people be baptized and repent of their sins when they go under the water, one is coming after me who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. This is someone other than the normal average human being or even a prophetic person who's been in the, in the presence of God. John the Baptist is saying something so important about who Jesus is to the people. In fact, if you look at all the gospel writers, in the beginning, they're trying to give the reader a sense of who Jesus is. And, and, and John, one of the followers of Jesus, wrote this about Jesus in his first chapter of his gospel. He said, through him, that's Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Huh. Jesus made everything. He made you. He made the person you're sitting next to. He made this building. He made the air you breathe. He, he was part of that original creation. So, so if he, he has this authority that's so attractive, it's because He's God. He's part of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit in the beginning, Genesis 1, in the creation. So let's just stop and let our, our, our minds and imaginations sort of flow. This, this Jesus, he, he was there in the beginning when the universe was created. Isaiah says he, he created the universe with the span of of his hands, that he set every star in place, and he knows every one of their names, and he hasn't lost one star. And you start to think about how many stars that is. I mean, here's the number. It's a billion trillion stars, and they're still discovering more and more stars. I mean, we, we don't even know how to say a number like this. And, and in this vast universe that Jesus created in the beginning, there are 125 billion Galaxies, And one of those galaxies we live in is called the Milky Way Galaxy. We live in the Milky Way Galaxy, this one of 125 billion galaxies in the entire universe. Are you feeling small yet? Well, you'll feel smaller in a second. And of this 100 billion stars in the Milky Way Galaxy, there's, there's one particular star that he gave a name to. It's called the Sun. And around that sun that is massive rotates this little blue planet called Earth. And on this planet Earth, there's a little spot of dirt called the Wilderness of Galilee. And on this little spot of Earth in the Wilderness of Galilee, God came down and walked in sandals. And John says, the God who's gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit, the God who created the heavens and the earth, he's gonna come down on earth and I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. Jesus would walk this earth with sandals he would walk from place to place. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a chariot. He never wrote a book. He never went to a university. He never started an organization. And yet, he is and was and will always be the most influential person who ever lived on the planet, right? 
And, and, and Mark wants us to make some of these connections. When we think about the holiness and the power and the authority of God, and we think of just a common person walking in sandals, I mean, I, I think of this moment when Moses is walking in the desert, and there's this bush that's on fire, and he approaches it, and God says, Moses, take off your sandals because the place that you're standing is holy ground. I think of that most time back in, in Joshua's life when Joshua's about to go and, and battle Jericho and he meets this angel of the Lord, this appearance of Jesus before his incarnation. And this angel says, take off your sandals, Joshua. The place you're standing is holy ground. So who is Jesus? He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the almighty God, the Alpha and Omega. He was with God in the beginning and he was God made flesh and he is now a God in sandals. Walking around in Galilee and showing what the authority of God looks like. And so with that kind of context, we're, we're gonna now read his first sermon, his first moment. He's, he's been baptized, heaven has opened up, the spirit of God has descended on him like a dove. He's called his first disciples and said, follow me. And now they go to a little city called Capernaum. And here's what happens next. Verse 21. And they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. There you see it, the first thing that attracts people to Jesus, the way he teaches. He teaches with authority. Now, just to give you an idea, sometimes when you read the Bible, you, you might be like a skeptical person, like, I don't know, do these places even exist? And, and, and I don't even know if I, I, I know all this, this stuff is true and real. I was one of those skeptics before I became a Christian. But I want to say that, that that synagogue in Capernaum is actually still there. I was there a couple of years ago. And if you go... With, with us to Israel next March, you can see this synagogue. It's, it's built in the second, third century. It's got this Roman white marble on top, but if you go one layer down, you can still see the black basalt layer that was the foundation and the wall in Jesus' time. It seated about 150 people, and people would come, and they would listen to different rabbis speak and teach, and Jesus walked into the synagogue, and he begins to teach with such authority that people are amazed. You see, back in the day, if you were a rabbi, you might come and you might say, you know, here's what the word of God says. And Rabbi Hillel, he has his, his idea. And scholars believe this or believe that. And I think this or I think that. And, and they're sort of doing their best to try to figure out how you explain an almighty God. Jesus didn't, didn't teach that way. Jesus would say things like, you know, you've heard it said, uh, the Moses said to, 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 to not commit adultery. But here's what I say. Here's what the law really meant. Here's what Moses said maybe meant to say, but didn't say. And let me, let me enlighten you to the depth of the law of God and the heart of God and the mind of God. And people are like, you know more than Moses? You're 30 years old. You know more than the rabbis who are 60 and 70? He taught with such authority. It took the breath of the people away. It's like going to a classroom where the professor that's teaching you actually wrote the book that you're reading. You understand? But actually more than that, it's actually the professor who wrote the book and made you and made your brain and made the entire uh, you know, thing you're studying and saying, well, let me teach you about you and everything you need to know about the world. And that's what it would be like to be in Jesus' school. He is not repeating the truth. Listen, he is the origin of truth. Now think about that. You're in the school of the God-man who is the origin of all truth, who's never been wrong. Jesus is not right 99.9% .9 of the time. Jesus is right 100% of the time. He cannot lie. He cannot make a mistake. He is God Almighty, a God in sandals. Aren't you grateful for a God like that? His word is so reliable. And, and, so, and so you can write down this simple idea. Jesus' words have authority in our lives because he is God. If Jesus says something to you, if Jesus gives you a command, if Jesus gives you an insight, if you read something in the Bible, in the red letters, you know for certain this is true and it's for you. 
And so as Jesus is teaching this first sermon in Capernaum in the synagogue, something crazy happens in the middle of this first sermon. Look, look, look with me at verse 23. So just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. This is kind of one of those moments where you're at church and something crazy happens and everyone's like, what's gonna happen? Who's security gonna get that guy? What's, what's the pastor gonna do? Everyone's looking back and forth and everyone looks at Jesus' face, I'm sure, because in those moments, you're always looking, what, what, is, is, is the pastor, is the leader, is he freaked out by this? And, and watch what Jesus does. He doesn't do like an incantation. He doesn't, he doesn't have a long speech. He just, he just says, be quiet and come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This had to be like one of those moments in church that you never would have forgot. This little Jewish boy, this little Jewish girl, mommy, let's go to, let's go to synagogue. And whoa. People are like, who is this guy? He's speaking with a level of power and authority inside I've never heard before. And then this demonic presence comes in this man speaking, maybe oh, like one of those moments, you're like, oh, everyone get out of here. And Jesus is not concerned and not afraid. He doesn't say, I'm gonna give you to the count of three. One, two, three. He doesn't, he doesn't again go back to his Bible and, and, and recite some kind of like, you know, prayer. He just says, be quiet, shut up, and get out. That, that's authority, right? And, and listen, listen, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever been in like a, a battle. I mean, I, I remember like as a little kid, sometimes I like, I, I talked a little bit too much and the, the neighbor kids came over and then there's like this little battle going on between you and the neighbor kids and who the toughest guys, I'm like eight years old or whatever. And, and, and now it's like, you know, getting ready, we're, we're gonna get ready to throw down, I guess, you know, eight year old throw down in the neighborhood, you know? And all of a sudden you hear, you hear this voice behind you, get out of this yard and go home because dad showed up behind you. You understand what I'm saying? And all those bullies just dissipated. Well, this is so much more than that. Listen, this might freak you out, but I just want to say this. Jesus is not battling demons, and he's a little bit stronger than them. Jesus created those demons, those fallen angels. When Jesus battles against Satan, Jesus is not battling an enemy that's a little bit weaker than him. Listen, Jesus made Satan. Jesus made the devil. Now, that may freak you out a little bit, but if you read Isaiah chapter 14, if you read Revelation chapter 12, you'll see that Satan is a fallen angel named Lucifer. And he thought that he could take power and authority and take over heaven. And he was cast down along with a third of the angels. Those demons are fallen angels, and Satan is one of them. And You've probably heard this phrase before, never bring a knife to a gunfight. Listen, this is even more than that. Jesus is almighty God. He's never gonna lose a battle with Satan. Never, ever, ever, right? And this is the God we serve. So you can never have to live in that kind of state of being freaked out like, oh no, this, this presence of evil in the world is stronger than Jesus. It, it's, it's not. And so people are, are amazed. And, and not just the power to teach with authority without error, and not just the ability to cast out demonic spirits, but also something that's sort of shocking when you hear it, because in the next chapter, there's a man who's lame. His friends bring him, not in the house through the door, but through the roof, because the crowds are gathered so much around Jesus. And, and Jesus looks at this lame man in chapter two, and he says this, your sins are forgiven. And everyone sort of freaks out. The religious leaders are like, this is blasphemy. No one has the power or authority to forgive sins except what? God, God himself. You just committed blasphemy. Jesus doesn't get freaked out. Say, oh, you know, I, I, I misspoke. He, he, says, he says this. Mark chapter two, verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So he says to the man, take up your bed and walk. And the man gets up and walks. Drop the mic. End of sermon. Now, if you're the type of person who's sort of seeking after God and you want to know more about Jesus and this whole series about who is Jesus is sort of like you're writing down notes, you're asking questions, and you've been the type of person who said, you know, I like and respect Jesus. He's, he's a prophet. He spoke about love and the golden rule and, and the Beatitudes, and I love, like if the world ran the way Jesus would explain it, that's why I love and admire Jesus. But the whole idea that he's the son of God, that he came from heaven, that, the, that he's God himself, that he's God in sandals, like, I, 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 can't, I can't swallow that one. But listen, what, what, kind of, what kind of prophet says, I have the power to forgive sins? You say only God can forgive sins? I wanna show you the power and authority I have. I'm gonna say for your sins are forgiven, or I'm gonna say rise up and walk. It doesn't matter. I can heal physically, I can heal emotionally, I can heal spiritually, because I am a God in sandals. This is who Jesus is as he reveals himself to people. And it's sort of, again, unsettling, because you're like, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know Jesus had that much power. So, but here's the question for us 2,000 years later. Does Jesus have that type of authority in your life, in my life? Like we, we take what it meant to them, and we've got to ask them, well, what does it mean for us? See, Jesus will command demons to flee. Jesus will command sickness to leave. Jesus will forgive sin, but he won't demand the same of you. There's an invitational aspect of Jesus where he would say to people, hey, come, if you're heavy laden, bring your burden to me, I'll give you rest for your soul. Hey, if you wanna follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. I'm inv inviting you, I'm not coercing you, I'm not demanding, and, and it's your choice. Jesus is giving us this, this level of choice, so if you're a follower of Jesus, he'll say, will, will, you, will you obey me and honor me with your body, with your, with your sexuality, with what you eat and what you drink, or are you gonna sort of just do your own thing and, and push my authority away? Are, are, you gonna, are you gonna let my authority reign in the way that you spend your money? Because it's not your money anyway, it's what I gave you, and you're a steward of it. Are you gonna let me speak into what you do with your time? Is that authority of Jesus that's so powerful back then, is it still present in your life today? And listen, it's your choice. It's always going to be your choice, and Jesus is inviting us to think about if he could command the authority, but he won't. And he just invites you to receive the authority in his life. How much greater and richer and more powerful will your life be if you submit and honor the authority of Jesus in your life? So he goes on from this preaching moment in verse 29, and he goes straight into his first physical healing that Mark records, and this physical healing is going to be not a stranger, but a friend. Verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up, and the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. And that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed, and the whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. And he also drove out many demons because he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. What does Jesus do when he heals Peter's mother-in-law? So we know Peter was married, and now Peter's wife's mom is sick, and she has a fever, and, and Jesus uses his authority to serve. You can write down that simple idea. Jesus uses his authority to serve. And here's what you're gonna find in life. The greater your sacrifice, the greater your authority. The more you serve other people, the greater your influence in their life. Is that true of you? You know, we often carry our authority in ways we've seen other people model authority. So if we've had a boss or a mom or dad who would say things like, it's my way or the highway, then we sort of just model what we've seen. If you have power, it could be the volume of your voice. 
It could be the demanding of the way that you do certain things, but Jesus is showing us a completely different type of authority for someone who knows everything and has never been wrong and has all power. Jesus is using his authority to serve. In fact, we see this so many times in Jesus' life. The Son of Man didn't come here to be served, but to serve. We see this, this God in sandals who, who takes his disciples' sandals off and washes their feet when, when he's about to go through the worst experience of his life. He's thinking about them and not himself. He's showing us that authority serves. Even back in the day, students of rabbis would not wash the feet of their masters because it was seemed too lowly of a task. But Jesus took the lowest possible task to serve in the greatest possible way. And that's part of why people were so attracted to his authority. In the world we live in today, authority says you take for yourself. You have the power to take. So you use your power to get things for yourself. Jesus says, no, you use your power and authority to give things away. So, so let's just stop and think about the, the authority that God's given you and how you use it. As a mom or a dad, is your authority serving or demanding? As a boss, as a leader, as a leader of volunteers, do you use your words to, to get people to comply, or do you find ways to serve them as they serve the mission that you're on? These are important questions. Is, is your authority attractive? Do people step forward to go, I want to follow him. I want to follow her. And maybe even a more important question, is your authority attractive to the people closest to you? When the lights are off and the cameras are gone and the door is shut and you're with your roommates in your apartment, with your kids, your family, your husband, your wife, is your authority serving? Is it attractive? Jesus is inviting us to have this type of authority. Maybe we could ask this question, is my authority repelling people? Because if your power and authority is about control and having it your way, you might find yourself repelling people and you're not even aware of it. Jesus' authority is attracting people everywhere he goes. And in verse 35, we get an indication of why this is. Mark writes, very early in the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also, because that is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus has attracted a crowd. He's healed people. He stayed up all night. I mean, he's tired, but, but in the morning, he's gone. He's, he sneaks away to a quiet place to pray. And this is what we see all the time, that the authority of Jesus is flowing out of a submission to the Father. He would say things like this, I don't speak a word unless the Father has told me to speak it. I don't do an action until the Father has told me to, to do that action. There is this authority that flows out of submission that we see in the life of Jesus. We see it in the life of, of John the Baptist. We see it in the life of people who carry authority in the right way. That They find this time of quietness to say, God, I don't want to misrepresent you. I want to honor you. I want to hear what you have to say. You can write down this simple idea that Jesus' authority fueled his mission. He, he knew he wasn't there to heal every leper. He wasn't there to heal every person with every disease. But he knew if he spent time with the Father, the Father would show him the next step. And so that makes me ask the question, as I live my life as a follower of Jesus, am I modeling my life after Jesus? Or do I just go where the crowd is and where the applause is and where people are saying, that was awesome, do it again? Or am I able to say, you know, God, there's some really amazing things happening over here, but I want to know what you want me to do today. And if you say go to where no one is or go to a new place, then, then I want to be open to hear your voice. I want to say what you want me to say and do what you want me to do. And, and that a level of submission to the Father fuels Jesus' mission, the clarity of his mission. I have come to let people know that there is 
forgiveness of sin. I've come to let people know the kingdom of God has come. I've let people know that yes, they can be physically and emotionally healed, but the deepest need of humanity is a spiritual separation from God because of sin, and I have come to die to take their place for the forgiveness of sin of the whole world. Aren't you grateful for the clarity of the mission of Jesus, this rescue mission he has us on? And, and, and we're gonna see in a moment this invitation to be on this mission with Jesus. And so we're gonna close out chapter one by reading this last story about a man with leprosy. In verse 40, we read this. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was indignant. Your Bible might say Jesus was filled with pity. He filled with compassion, the Greek word orizo, as Jesus looks at how sin has destroyed this man's body. He, he reaches out his hand and touches the man and says, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And Jesus sent him at once with a strong warning. See, you don't tell anyone about this, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news, and as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. And yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Last idea we get from, from what we see in this healing miracle is that Jesus' authority can change your life. He can heal you physically, he can heal you emotionally, and he can heal you spiritually. You know, the word leprosy today doesn't mean what it meant back then. But you think about how freaked out all of us are by COVID and the tragedy that we've seen unfold, but leprosy was far worse than social distancing and masks in 10 days. Because if you live back in the day and you one day just noticed this little white spot on your hand, you already knew. And maybe you covered it up because you didn't want anyone else to know because that white spot was eventually gonna grow and turn pink and then turn red and then turn brown. And then it was slowly gonna spread throughout your entire body, killing nerves. And over the next 10 years, your body would begin just to waste away because you wouldn't know there was a pebble in your shoe and you'd injure yourself and you wouldn't feel it. And so people would have uh, the loss of fingers, the loss of toes, the, the loss of their nose, part of their face. They, they would have to, at 100 paces, say, unclean, unclean, so people wouldn't come near them. You could no longer go to the synagogue. You could no longer go to a family dinner. You could no longer hang out or have conversations with your friend other than if you were at a distance. It was a disease worse than death. And you know what the Jews used to say about people that got leprosy? They called it the judgment of God. It was actually called the finger of God. If you had got leprosy, you must have done something really bad and you thought you got away with it, but God got you. The finger of God has cursed you. And so you live with this sense of, I am cursed, the sense of social isolation. Imagine not being touched by another human being for 10 years. And, and Luke says that this guy, he was full of leprosy, which means he was in the final stages. I mean, he was probably pretty rough looking. And he asks Jesus this question, if you're willing. On his knees, he begs him. I know you can heal me if you're willing. If, if you don't think I've gotten too far away from God or I'm so cursed, I know you have the power and authority, but, but are you willing to heal me? I wonder, have, you ever, have you ever asked Jesus that question? Like you know he has the power to do something, but he hasn't done it in your life, and you're like, are you, are you even willing to heal me? And Jesus looks at him and says, I am willing. Then he says, be clean. And, and this man is healed, and people are like, wait, we've never seen anyone healed from leprosy. I mean, there's only two other recorded healings from leprosy in the entire biblical record before this moment. One is Miriam, Moses' sister, who's healed by God himself. The other is a man named Naaman, a Syrian, who washes in the Jordan seven times and is healed. But the people in this time have never seen a miracle of healing of leprosy. They've just never seen it before. The only person that can heal leprosy is God himself. You get the idea? God himself is gonna heal this man, and people are like, whoa. And, 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 and back in the day, you couldn't touch someone with leprosy because it made you unclean, so check this out. 
So if Jesus touches this man, does Jesus become unclean? No, because the moment he touches him, he becomes clean, right? Because Jesus' power and holiness and authority is greater than any sin or sickness or death that's in the world, right? So in, Jesus doesn't become unclean. He heals the man in a moment, in an instant, and this man becomes clean, and he realizes that something miraculous has happened. And then Jesus says, now go and show yourself to the priests. Because there's this law of Moses, Leviticus 13 and 14, where priests would diagnose skin diseases and then in Leviticus 14, they would declare someone clean. Well, these priests had never been able to declare someone clean from leprosy their entire life. So I can imagine if he would have gone to the temple, they'd be looking like, uh, we don't even know what to do. We've never seen anything like this before. And Jesus says, I want you to go to the temple as a testimony to them. I want the priests to know that God has arrived. I want the priests to know that the kingdom of God has come, that lepers are now being healed, that demons are now being cast out, that the Son of God has now come. Jesus is saying to this man, go and tell your story to someone else. And that's what we're commanded to do. When, when God does a miraculous work in our life, we are commanded to go in the authority of Jesus and tell that story. Now, I wanna say this, that some of you may have, be, have been praying for a healing from God for, for a long time and it hasn't come. And I just wanna say that if God hasn't healed you yet, it is not his lack of ability, but it's because of his sovereignty. There is, there's a plan that God has in your life. And there are times that God has answered prayers that I've prayed and begged him for, and there are times where he said no. And I don't understand why he makes the decisions he makes, but here's what I know. You can trust in God's good grace in your life. He is, he is trustworthy. And his plans are different than our plans. And part of the walk of faith of following Jesus is not always getting the answer to the why question. It's just saying, I will choose to obey. And this man, he decides he can't help. He just has to go tell everyone. So now, as we read through the Gospel of Mark, there's so many crowds everywhere that Jesus has to continually slip away to quiet places to continue to do and be on the mission that God has called him to be on. So where does that leave us? Well, all the authority of Jesus has been given to us. Now you're like, well, well first of all, let's, let's see what, the, what authority Jesus has. Colossians 2.10, in him, that's Jesus, you have been made complete and he is the head over all rule and all authority. Jesus is over creation, he's over the things that are visible and invisible, powers and principalities and rulers and authorities. He's over everything that's political, everything that's social, everything that's economic, everything that's biological. He is over all of those things. And at being the sovereign Lord of creation and the Alpha and Omega, he says this to his disciples when he puts them on a mission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Wow. Wow. And that wasn't just for back then. That great commission is, is a command for us. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, go. You are my hands and feet. You are the body of Christ. You are the family of God. Use the authority I've given you to serve and love people. Go and tell your story. So just two quick stories. Yesterday, we had an outreach at North Lauderdale, and it was an outreach for, for single moms, and we would wash their cars and, and, and hang out with their kids and, and love on them and give them flowers. And, and, and as these moms would come on, one of them was, was a widow, and she was just in just a, just a tough spot, just dejected and despondent, just depressed, like just so lonely. But one of our volunteers who was serving there was also a widow. And so with this authority that God has given her and a story God has given her to serve. She shared a conversation with this woman and this woman at the end of that conversation prayed to ask Jesus into her life because the gospel is still at work and we have this authority to share and to serve and this authority will change people's lives. Listen, I speak today with authority, not because I know everything about God, but I know that his word is true and so if I'm reading this to you, this authority doesn't come from me, it comes from him and it has power in the lives of people. There's a man who was in our congregation three years ago, and he had this passion to start a Bible study in Parkland. His name is Steve. And on February 14th, three years ago today, he got permission to hold a Bible study in a community center. It was the same day, three years ago, of the tragic Parkland shooting where 17 people lost their lives. And you sort of scratch, scratch your head like, oh, how does that happen? And there was a woman that day named Roxanna and her two 
Kids were, were at Stoneman Douglas during the shooting, and she had to run to a particular hotel to see if they were still alive, because that's where parents would find out the news. And she went to this particular hotel, and she found out her kids were okay, and she, she thanked God for, for that moment. And, well, last Friday night, she led worship in that same hotel. She's part of the Parkland Church plant. The Bible study has become a church plant. And now she's leading worship in the same place. Three years ago, she picked her kids up. And today, this afternoon, there's an outreach in that city. And listen, because God knew that the city of Parkland needed spiritual first responders. God knew that the, the city of Parkland needed to know that, that evil would not have the last word, that there is a hope in the gospel, there is a redemption in what God does, that evil is not gonna have the last word, that God's people go in the authority of Christ to serve the city and to love people in Jesus' name. And so I think we need to be reminded, we need to be reminded that evil does not have the last word. And so I'm gonna ask you to stand. If, if you're at home, you can stand. If you're at another campus, you can stand. I'm just gonna read to you. What happens when Jesus comes back? You see this God who walked the Galilean desert and, and walked in sandals. At some point, he's gonna take those sandals off and he's gonna return. How many of you know Jesus is coming back? Okay, and this is the hope of the church. Here's the return of Jesus. John, in the book of Revelation, says this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war, and his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. And he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is our Jesus. This is his authority. And this is his power that is on our side. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you give us this authority to go and to serve in your name. Lord, help us to carry it well. And Father, when we feel like evil is winning, we feel like it's too much and we can't take the next step. Just give us that image that you will return in a triumphant manner, that even though you allowed yourself to be crucified, that you took that humiliation, that worst moment of suffering in history, and you turned it into glory, and you want to do that in our lives. You want to do that in our church. And so, God, give us this deep sense of hope and perseverance and love for the people around us. Help us to carry your authority in a way that honors you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, before I say amen, I'm just gonna ask you to remain standing. We're gonna close with a simple invitation. And it's an invitation to, to let the authority of Jesus be real in your life. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I, I, I believe in Jesus. And I know he's the savior of the world, but the question is, have you, have you submitted your life to him? We say that Jesus is, is Savior and Lord, which means, God, I don't just believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me, but I want to give you my life and live under his authority and his reign and trust that what you say is more important than what I say. And that, that's a decision you have to make. Jesus is not going to force you or coerce you, but he invites you. I'm knocking at the door. If you'll open your door, I'll come in and we'll have a conversation. To anyone who receives me, I will give them the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. Not out of a human birth origin, but because of the gift of adoption. Jesus is looking for people that are willing to say, I trust you and I will follow you with my life. And today, if you've not made that decision, we're going to play a closing song. And we're going to ask you just to slide into the aisle. You're already standing and just walk up here and we're going to pray a simple prayer that sounds like this. God, open my heart. Jesus I invite you inside. I wanna, I wanna follow you. I wanna give you my life. I'm gonna ask you to forgive my sins. And that simple prayer 
will change your eternal destination. It'll begin to change you from the inside out. It'll begin to change what is important to you in life. It'll begin to shape you and reshape you and reorient you to the things of God. He's the one who made you. He's the one who knows you. And there's nothing that you've ever done, nothing that you've ever done that will keep him from inviting you to forgiveness because his forgiveness and grace is more powerful than your sin and your disappointment and even your repetitive failures. It's more powerful than your addiction or your depression or all your doubts. Listen, this is the power of an almighty God who's saying, just come to me and I can make all things new. Today, if you know you want that, if you know you need that, I'm gonna ask you to come forward right now and do not hesitate and watch Jesus change your life. If that's you, come. just respond to the greatest invitation ever given, an invitation from God Almighty. And so we're going to pray a prayer in a moment where this is your prayer of confession, your prayer of repentance, it's your prayer of acknowledgement. And if you're online, you can just put in the chat, I want to pray this, or text the word believe to 31352. We don't want anyone to miss this moment. Wherever you're listening to my voice, this invitation is for you. And so I'm just going to give you some simple words to a prayer. They're my words, but it's an expression of your heart to God, and he will hear this prayer of faith, and he will answer it because he makes his promises, and he keeps his promises. Pray this after me. Say this. Lord God, I open my heart, and I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today, I repent. Now, fill me with your spirit, and I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, and welcome to the family of God. Yeah, so before you guys go back to your seats, I want to ask you for five minutes of your time. You just made the most important decision of your life. I'm going to ask you to follow me and Tully and the guys over to that open door. You'll, you'll be back with your friends in a moment. We want to give you a Bible and a Bible study guide. So follow along this way, and let's give them a hand as they go this way. And church, we're going to close in a song of worship. But just a reminder that we go in the name of Jesus and we take our authority and we use it to serve because we are the body of Christ. We are his hands and we are his feet. And so let's close in a song of praise, acknowledging his power in our lives. Love you, church. See you next week.
Amen. What an amazing time of worship. Worship team, thank you so much for leading us. Also, thank you, Pastor Doug, for leading us in today's Bible study. Those of you online, you're dismissed at this time. Those in the room, please have a seat. We're gonna dismiss you in an orderly fashion on our extreme left here. Hey everyone, thanks so much for being part of our service today. I wanna to remind you that there's an opportunity for you to learn even more about Mark chapter one by joining us on Wednesdays at 6.30 online with your group for a teaching moment. Now you can do this with people you do life with, your family, your friends, or your group that you have through Calvary, whether it's online or in person, but it's a great time for you to dive even deeper to God's word to apply it to your everyday life. And if you wanna learn even more about what's going on in the book of Mark, there is an amazing resource page for book, the book of Mark on our website. So you can go to calvaryftl.org for more. So be sure to check that out. We love you church, we're praying for you, and we cannot wait to see you soon.